You went now listening to British Brothers, the True Crime Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases and serial killers. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is the sixth episode of season eight. Before we get going I must apologise for my rather rubbish setup today. No lighting, I'm sort of stripping the walls, the studio is getting done out over the course of the next few weeks. This is all I can offer. I can't be asked putting my lights up and stuff, it's just a bit of a ball ache. Just wanted to point that out for you. This week's case was suggested by a listener who wants to remain anonymous. We're in the West Yorkshire town of Meltham this week, a place very close to home for me personally. I lived there for three years back in my uni days. I worked at the Morrison supermarket there for six years and many of my friends used to or still live there. As of the 2021 census, the estimated population of Meltham is 9,108. Let me quickly advise you that this podcast contains elements that may be alarming to some listeners. As always, listener discretion is advised. This week's story begins in what is referred to as the me decade, the 1970s. I've heard of the roaring 20s and the swinging 60s, but that nickname for the 70s is a new one on me. Early on in that decade, this episode's villain was in a long-term relationship with a woman called Carol. Our villain goes by the name Kenneth Bill, and he was born in roughly 1949, a year before Carol. The couple spent half a decade together, and things were looking like they were going to last forever until one deal-breaking conversation took place. The topic was marriage. Carol wanted it. Kenneth had no interest. Sticking to her guns, Carol insisted that if Kenneth was not prepared to get married, their relationship may as well end, because to her, it was non-negotiable. Kenneth didn't budge, so Carol left him. The decision wasn't easy by any means. Carol described her time spent with Kenneth during those five years as fun and recalled her former lover being a man who was generous to a fault. With Carol instigating the split, Kenneth was left in an unenviable position. The woman of his dreams had walked out on him and he struggled to get over it. Based on the research I've done, it doesn't seem as if he ever got over it. Kenneth did go on to father three children, I assume to the same woman, but I can't say for sure, so he did seemingly find love again in some capacity, but nobody he met would ever live up to Carol in his eyes. Carol, on the other hand, eventually got her wish granted when she married a man named John Hay in around 1976. Born on November 4th, 1950, John was raised in the Huddersfield village of Almondbury, where he attended Almondbury High School. John was a well-behaved child and rarely, if ever, got into any bother, something he could attribute to his solid upbringing. As John grew into adulthood, he began pursuing a career in the police force and went on to join West Yorkshire Police. His career as a police officer led to John transitioning into the role of a traffic officer, where interestingly he became George Oldfield's driver. George Oldfield was a West Yorkshire Police detective who finished his career as an assistant chief constable. You may know him as the man that led the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry in the mid to late 70s. John Hay was responsible for driving George Oldfield to North East England, specifically Sunderland, when John Samuel Humble's Wearside Jack Hoax tape was being investigated as part of the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry. John and Carol met whilst the former was in the police, and they soon started a family of their own, as had Kenneth Bill. They welcomed a daughter named Louise, and a son named John, after his dad, to the world. Unfortunately, John's time with West Yorkshire Police was cut short prematurely after an accident while he was off duty. He was medically discharged from the force and decided to pursue his interest in all things DIY. John had always been a keen builder in his spare time outside of work, but now he had a chance to turn his hobby into a profession, which is exactly what he did. As John and Carol approached their golden years, they lived in a place called Fenny Bridge, another small Huddersfield village located a couple of miles east of Almondbury. With his endearing personality and huge six foot four inch frame, John was known throughout the market town. His striking white hair, signature white moustache and white van were recognised by many. John soon made the step up from being a father to being a grandfather, and let me tell you, his grandkids were his absolute world. With Carol by his side, John would take the grandkids up to scenic Northumberland, and would even sometimes venture abroad with them to the Canary Islands. John enjoyed nothing more than dropping his granddaughter off at school every morning. 
It gave him such pleasure and made him proud as punch. It saddens me to inform you that, in all likelihood, John's granddaughter was likely the last family member to see him alive. Our key chain of events began in October 2011. It was during that month that Kenneth Bill randomly bumped into his old flame, Carol. A brief stop and chat occurred, but as far as Carol knew, that was the end of the encounter. She had long since moved on from Kenneth and was now a happily married woman to her husband John. What Carol did not realise was that the brief encounter with her old flame ignited a spark that relit the embers of old. Kenneth's previously numbed feelings towards Carol suddenly rushed back to the surface and were so unbearable that he began stalking her. After some time spent observing his ex from afar, Kenneth and Carol would go on to meet up again. Old feelings then began to rise within Carol, one thing led to another, and the two began an affair. Carol would later say that she had no intention of ever leaving a husband for Kenneth. She was happy being married to John, but the excitement of a brief few months of rekindling with her ex was clearly too much to resist. Kenneth, on the other hand, didn't view it as casually as Carol did. He wanted the couple's relationship to commence where it had left off over three decades earlier. Kenneth floated the idea to Carol of him renting a bungalow nearby so that if she ever had an argument with John or felt like she needed to get away for a night or two, she could stay there with him. The term used to describe the bungalow was bolt hole, which like the me decade is a term I've never heard before. With the bungalow idea going down like a lead balloon, Kenneth upped the ante and asked Carol to move in with him outright. Kenneth lived at Upper Hag Road in the Homefirth village of Thongsbridge, six miles southwest of Fennybridge. It seems like he was being a bit intense with Carol during the affair. Carol would later say, I felt he was hounding me all the time. I wanted to say something to stop him hounding me. To do that, Carol said all the right things when it came to agreeing to live with Kenneth or regarding the bolt hole idea, but she had no intention of following through with any of her promises. As Christmas 2011 approached, Kenneth was continuing to hound Carol by sending her text messages in which he explained how obsessed he was with her and that she drove him nuts. He also reportedly attempted to send Carol a rather inappropriate Christmas present, which she declined to accept. Three months into their affair, in February 2012, Carol told Kenneth they would no longer be seeing each other. For Kenneth, it was the mid-70s all over again. His one true love had once again broken it off with him and he could not get his head around why. He was loving, complimentary, affectionate, kind. Why on earth did Carol want to stay with her husband instead of continuing her old life with him? That was the question that plagued Kenneth the most, and is what ultimately led to him becoming a murderer. Carol said of the affair, He told me that he loved me, that he'd never stopped loving me, and that we should never have split up. For Kenneth, the problem was John. If he was out of the picture, Kenneth and Carol could have their fairy tale life together. In a bizarre move that sheds a huge light on the mental effect all of this was having on Kenneth, he decided to type a letter. The intended recipient was John Hay, Carol's husband. John had no idea who Kenneth was, by the way. He'd never met him and didn't even know he existed. Kenneth had a proposal that he wanted John to consider a three way relationship. Here's a summary of the letter Kenneth wrote for John. John, I am writing this not to tell you that Carol and I have been seeing each other since last October and she was going to move into a bungalow with me after Christmas. I am writing to ask you to tell her that you won't mind if she sees me occasionally. I hope you will be able to let her carry on seeing me occasionally as I am sure this will give her the best of both worlds. I want her to be happy and I am sure you do too. She deserves it, don't you think? If you decide that you don't want her to see me again, please don't mention this letter to her. Just look after her and keep her safe. K. Once typed, Kenneth handed the letter to Carol and asked her to pass it on to John. Rather than doing so, Carol shredded the letter. Here's where the story gets dark. Kenneth had begun brainstorming ideas about how he could remove John from the picture so that he could have Carol all to himself. Some of his work colleagues recalled him asking some not suitable for work questions about the possibility of dissolving a human body in a barrel of sulfuric acid. Kenneth would challenge his colleagues to pick out flaws in his theoretical murder plans, with the intended victim being his ex-partner's husband. None of Kenneth's colleagues took him seriously, which I think is pretty understandable given the circumstances, so his behaviour wasn't reported to the police. As the transition from fantasy to reality became ever closer, Kenneth sent Carol an ultimatum over text. If she didn't leave John and begin a new relationship with Kenneth, he would either kill himself, 
kill John or tell John about their three-month affair. It doesn't stay anywhere what Carol's response to that threat was, so we may as well jump ahead to March 13th, 2012. Kenneth phoned John and left a voicemail. Speaking with a mouthful of marbles to disguise his voice, Kenneth said his name was Eric Johnson, and he had some work John may be interested in at Meltham Mills Industrial Estate. Kenneth had a unit at the industrial estate just off Huddersfield Road, near the centre of Meltham. The following day, March 14th, John returned Kenneth's call to inquire about what work he was referring to. Kenneth said he wanted some building work pricing up, so the pair agreed to meet at Kenneth's industrial unit the following day. When John arrived at the unit on March 15th, 2012, the man he shook hands with was, to him, a complete stranger. To Kenneth, this was the man standing in the way of a happy life with his soulmate. Soon after the meeting, Kenneth led John inside the unit, locked the door, and beat him to death. Kenneth then used duct tape to bind John's arms and legs before placing his body inside a large canvas builder's bag. He then used a horse box to transport John's body to his home in Thongsbridge. It was there where Kenneth lit the fire that would be used to burn John's body. After a day and a half, Kenneth placed John's burnt remains and ashes into several bags and disposed of them at a local recycling centre. It's worth noting here that, to this day, no pieces of John's body have ever been recovered. Once all of the bags had been disposed of, Kenneth still had the problem of John's white van to deal with. Naturally, the builder had driven it to the industrial estate to meet Kenneth. His plan was simple. He'd drive John's van to the Humber Bridge near Hull, East Yorkshire, and abandon it there. He'd then launch John's mobile phone into the River Humber and make his way home. There was a flaw in his plan, though. Kenneth caught a train from Hull to Huddersfield and didn't count on being caught by the train carriage's CCTV cameras. When John was reported missing, the police used the country's plethora of ANPR cameras to track his van's movements. They led the police to the Humber Bridge, exactly where Kenneth had dumped the van. On the journey across to Hull, John's phone was constantly pinging the cell towers along the way. When news of John's disappearance became known to the local community, Kenneth tried to convince his family that he had likely chosen to take his own life. That would have been such an out-of-character thing for John to do, though. He simply loved his family too much to do anything like that. Alarm bells began ringing at that point. On March 19th, 2012, four days after murdering John Hay, Kenneth Bill was arrested by West Yorkshire Police. The evidence against him having something to do with John's disappearance was overwhelming, but it didn't stop Kenneth from initially denying he'd ever met John. His story soon changed and John's death was confirmed, but Kenneth insisted he had fallen down some stairs and hit his head. He did not admit to having murdered John and would not plead guilty to the subsequent murder charge he faced. During his murder trial in the autumn of 2012, it came to light that Kenneth had stopped off in a local cafe near the Humber Bridge after abandoning John's white van. The conversation that took place was one the cafe's owner remembered vividly. Kenneth asked how many people chose to jump off the suspension bridge as he planned to make John's disappearance look like a suicide. The trial took place at Bradford Crown Court and concluded on September 20th, 2012, when the jury of seven women and five men returned to the courtroom after deliberating for between two and three hours. They unanimously found Kenneth Bill guilty of murdering John Hay. The following day, September 21st, 2012, Judge Peter Benson handed Kenneth a life sentence with a minimum term of 22 years. No emotion was shown by Kenneth as his sentence was passed. Judge Benson said in his closing statement, It seems to me that you were obsessed with Mrs. Hay, and you ruthlessly, in a detailed way, carried out this murder, and then ruthlessly and cold-bloodedly disposed of your victim's body. You were so keen to indulge your own emotions that you carried out this wicked murder. Not only did you murder him, but by disposing of his body in the cold-hearted way you did, you have robbed his family of the chance of giving him a decent burial. In a statement released after sentencing, the Hay family said that they were pleased it was over and that they had got justice for their beloved John. And that was the story of British murderer Kenneth Bill. Thanks again, anonymous listener, for suggesting that case. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Please continue emailing case suggestions to britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com or message me via social media. You'll not only get the episode covered, but you'll get a cheeky shout out too. And that does it for another episode. I've been Stuart Blues, this has been British Murders, thanks so much for listening, until next time, cheerio.